We are now come to the uh, part where you, the audience, have an opportunity to comment, to make a contribution, and also ask questions. Uh, what I will do is uh, I will uh, invite, we'll take three questions at a time, and then uh, after this point, then we'll go back to another round. So we'll take uh, questions uh, in the order in which people are raising hands. I'll start with you, Saleh. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anthony Casolo. I'm a lawyer in private practice. Um, sorry, Professor, I think when you touched on the question of compensation, I beg to differ with your assertions or the people you've interviewed. Because at that time, uh, when Manawasa decided that we should compensate those who had been tortured, who had been unlawfully detained, I was an advocate in, in the Attorney General's chambers, and what that person told you is not the, uh, the true picture of what we had agreed on. Um, bound by the Official Secrets Act, so I can't give much more details and just say that, no, that's not true. Um, that being the case, one of the problems which I've found with the history of Zambia is that we've in inherited the Official Secrets Act from the UK. Uh, Professor, if you remember, I think uh, it was eight, 1989, there was a book published in the UK by a former MI5 officer, and they used the Official Secrets Act to ban it from being published in the UK. That has not been amended in Zambia. And a lot of people are unable to give you a lot of information, historical information, because of that Official Secrets Act. I have had the opportunity, or I must say, I'm very fortunate that my father, who is now 90 years old, who worked for 35 years in this country, both in the colonial and the UNIP, UNIP era, not in the MMD era, has a lot of history, but each time I ask him a question which touches on some of uh, uh, issues which he dealt with as a civil servant, he says, I've not been cleared by the president to give you those details. <laughs> so that is the biggest problem I've seen. I was fortunate enough uh, at one time to have visited uh, the university where the good doctor is, John Hopkins University. And I met a lady who was working on a PhD in social anthropology. She had so much knowledge about my hometown, Chinsadi, that I'd never come across in Zambia. And these are research papers which were done in the, 19th, uh, the early 19th, but are not accessible to Zambians. I also came across a publication which gave a history of the struggle for independence of Zambia. And it was entitled, if I recall it correctly, A Green Peep in the North. When I go back to Zambia, I went to the special collections at UNZA to try and uh, uh, get a copy of that um, uh, publication. I was told it was not accessible and, 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 uh, to the public. So I could not even get a copy of it and maybe sit down with my dad and say, is this true what they wrote? You were working at that time under the British. Um, perhaps not to bore you, the role of chiefs which uh, the good doctors brought about, yes, indeed, I do recall this one, my dad was able to tell me that yes, we had Chief Nkula during the colonial times who opposed the colonialists and the colonists said they were going to dethrone him. And the members said, well, you can dethrone him with your white papers, but he's still our chief. So the chiefs he did, did play a critical role. Not only Chief Nkula, we also had Petro Chaponte, who went to London together with, I think, uh, Aka's dad or, or uncle for the struggle of independence negotiations at Lancaster House. A gentleman who carried his own beer from Kasama in a dry manner and brewed it in London and did not accept the Queen's whiskey or the Scottish whiskey. <laughs> so perhaps I agree with the last speaker that we need much more research into areas of history. Not only the history of the struggle, but perhaps let's also have a look at the history of education in, in this country. The White Fathers did a little bit, uh, Doctor, I think um, uh, Mr. Monacato wrote something, but we have not had any history written whatsoever on the role, for instance, of, of the missionaries in education in this country and the development of education. Perhaps as a parting shot, a lot of us standing or seated here today are wondering why the current government has named one university, Pongshindo University in Chinsali. Mr. Mkonge, would you know the reason? 
Nobody perhaps has ever told the story why Paul Mishindo has been honored. The only reason which comes to mind is that Paul Mishindo was the first Zambian to translate the Bible into Bemba. Thank you. Thank you. The person to the lady here. Uh, good evening, my name is Linda Kasonde. Um, you made the point earlier that um, the whole point of recording history is so that we can learn from our past uh, to avoid mistakes and perhaps also to learn things that we can use going forward. Um, you did also make mention that um, most of the political, well a lot of the political leaders nowadays are still people who came up through the independence struggle. And so maybe my question to you is, what can we, why are the young leaders not, um, you know, taking up the mantle? Uh, what, it is, what is it about the independent struggle people that, that maybe the young are not learning from in order to take up these, these challenges of leadership? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, third question. Uh, yes, sir. We can start with him and then you can go behind. Yes. My name is Mwenya uh, Mungkonge, and uh, I want to make your job a bit harder. What I would like you to do as historians is to change your approach and perhaps look at it from the cultural side. Um, some of the things that are happening today, it's like uh, 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 when you have your Bemba side, I, I have to declare that I'm Bemba, then you are told you can't marry a Tonga. But what was, that, what was the impact of those cultural standings on the final deliberation? There is a, yeah, I don't know if I should be brave enough to ask this, but I'll ask, and I hope I won't be judged harshly. We've had arguments in our history, was Kaunda Zambia, was Chuluba Zambia, you see? But it's an outcome of our culture and our movements historically that can weaken us. Because if you want to see a banda from Malawi and a banda from Eastern province, for those of us who can't speak uh, Chiche, Chichewa, then we have no choice of making the difference. Now, if a, a line drawn in the sand, or in, in the case of Rapula, drawn in the river, Rapula River, uh, separates a, a brother from being called the Congolese, or Zambia, does it give us a right to be Congolese or Zambian? I mean, you can pick. And I know that for my brothers in uh, Kaundeland, if I go to Chief Musamba's uh, traditional ceremony, half the people come from Congo and Angola to attend the traditional ceremony in Zambia. So if you could uh, also look at it from the other way around, of course, migration and these distinctions which are now made between Pembas, Visa, and these things that we throw out. Are we the same people? Is it true Mwata Kazembe was Chitimukulu's young brother? How can a young brother and an older brother both be paramount chiefs? What was the impact of that on our freedom, on our political disputation? Is that why it's difficult for a Bemba man to vote for a Tonga man? but has no problem a Tonga man marrying a Bemba woman. You see? So if you could look at it and enlighten me in that line, and I feel that that direction could give us perhaps some of the behind the scenes effects we're having now, I would, be, I would be grateful. Please also, I ask you to, what I would have liked would have been each place to have its own historical narration, Bemba, I see my uncle Akashaba, perhaps they have got some of the best uh, written history. But for the rest of us, there isn't even a single Bemba Museum. There's a Motomoto Museum, which my, uh, my grandfather here tells me at Yaurosh. It just tells us how, how strong we could bewitch the next man. So I also ask that our history in that regard be also be corrected, because as you said, it's written by the victors. And we have uh, Suganda buried somewhere in uh, uh, Isoka. Was it a great battle? Or was it just unfortunate? Did he die from malaria? So please, the young people, some of them, their cultural absence 
is th from that just not appreciating the basics, let alone the sophisticated items you're talking about now. Thank you. Uh, let's have a uh, last hand before we break. My question is about discourse and how we can't discuss, discount discourse in the, for in the formation of history and how um, the, shape of, the shape of the nation has been, is rooted in the circumstances from which um, the ruling parties emerged and basically yeah, how, how the, the, the freedom struggle shaped um, pe the way people perceived the world and this whole, talking about the whole idea of the lack of critical thinking um, and how, um, what's it called? Being able to question, being able to, qu being, being able to question wouldn't, wouldn't have served the purpose whilst trying to gain independence. That would have been sort of counteractive. And you know, maybe as a young nation, we need to bear that kind of thing in mind and how, we need to, how it's gonna take time to move away from that. So that was my question. Um, and questions? Um, thank you very much for those questions. I might take the first, second, and fourth and leave the third to my esteemed colleague. So let me touch on a couple of things. Um, in regard to the first question, um, in, in terms of compensation, I certainly saw some of the documents that individuals had been asked to sign. And the, it stated very clearly in English that it was necessary that these people, it, it described itself as a confidentiality agreement. These people had signed, and they were led to think by their lawyers, including people involved in the Human Rights Commission, that they were signing a confidentiality agreement. The fact that they didn't remain confidential, they, that they had, in effect, spent some of that money or all of that money and then spoke to an international researcher about what they had been through, is to me part of the answer about the Official Secrets Act and the impact that that has on research. I mean, I completely agree with the point you make about the deadening effect on historical research of secrecy and the signing of such agreements. That has been overcome gradually in somewhere like the UK, essentially by sometimes interviewing people on condition of anonymity, sometimes by people essentially refusing to accept that such draconian legislation should silence people in perpetuity. And we can see that there's, in a way, a battle over the representation of information. We can see it with things like WikiLeaks, and uh, uh, the, the, the leaking of information onto websites. That it is possible that people will take risks sometimes to put information into the public domain. But I agree with you completely that uh, the respect for the rule of law and so on can have a counterproductive effect on people speaking openly about these, these histories. And it's an ongoing struggle, perhaps. The question about young leaders is an interesting one. Uh, I think one of the things we must always remember is how young those independence leaders were. Uh, young men and women in their 30s, early 40s at the oldest in some cases. And they were people who came forward in that way. One of the points I tried to make in my presentation was that young Zambians at certain points in history have seen a connection between their individual hopes and aspirations and that of the nation. And there's a sort of question about whether in the period after independence and perhaps in the period after the multi-party democracy came in and didn't answer all the questions that people had, that, that people perhaps, perhaps become alienated from the nation that they seek to be part of. It doesn't appear to speak for them. And so the idea of becoming involved in politics perhaps is alienating. They might want to be in, a, in, in business or in music, or find cultural forms of expression, but politics seems, shall we say, an old man's game. And this comes back, I think, to the question of discourse and the founding, uh, the, the very sophisticated question that was asked last about the way that discourse, the use of language, restricts sometimes the ways in which we can imagine political expression. It seems that Zambia's, the ways in which Zambian politicians act and think is still very much defined by that early period of independence politics. And people f struggle to see their own aspirations, hopes, in ways which are different to that. How can I speak politically? How can I express myself? How can I further the aims of the people I know, my community, my schoolmates, my college mates, and so on? Because politics seems to be something else. 
doesn't appear to talk to me in my language. That's a real challenge, I think, the role of language in that. I don't think I have an easy solution to it, but it's, it's necessary, for, I think, for young people to define the language of politics in different sorts of ways. Um, very briefly, on the, on the, the, sort of the, 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 the question of, of culture and so on, I mean, I think the, the brief point I would make in response is there's something about a nation state which very quickly creates an artificial division. I mean, not just a border, but a division in people's minds. I've been reading in the National Archives about um, the interaction on the Copper Belt between Otkatanga, Copper Belt, and the Bemba and Lunda communities on both sides of that border. As we know, many Zambians, Zambians before 1964 went to work in those mines. And there's an estimation in the archives uh, by the uh, ambassador and the, high, and the consul in Lubumbashi that there are 250,000, quote, Zambians living in Old Katanga in 1965-66. But they, they're forced to choose. They have to be either Zambian or Congolese. And this was an artificial choice imposed on people by the nature of nationalism. You must belong to one or another. That didn't make sense to, for most of those ordinary experience. They had moved about. These people spoke their language. They were kith and kin. But suddenly they had to choose between the two. And that's one of the problems with the way in which nation states are defined. You must be with or not, citizen or, 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 or non-citizen. And I think that in reclaiming the ordinary experience of Zambians, which Dr. Kalusa spoke so eloquently about, we have to understand that the nation itself is, a, is an unhelpful framework sometimes to make sense of people's own history. Um, I don't know whether I, I really understood your, your question, and so if I give you a wrong answer, you should bear with me. Um, I think that uh, as we imagine what nation we are, uh, the question of culture to me is very paramount. Um, I think our challenge is to try to see how we have been breaking down uh, linguistic and cultural differences between the different ethnicities that make up Zambia. Uh, and there's no doubt that uh, we've been engaged in this task. And uh, I, I think sometimes I imagine that uh, there's a silent cultural revolution going on in this country which has escaped the eyes of uh, historians and other academics. I, I believe that uh, schools and colleges and universities are an important site where cultural differences and linguistic uh, differences are rapidly breaking down. And uh, perhaps one, one of our challenges to, is to try to see how, for example, uh, uh, Zambian students uh, use education as a site uh, where they engage in active cultural revolution. Um, perhaps it will be interesting to see how many cross-ethnic marriages are constituted by the fact that people are meeting in, in schools and, and universities. Um, I know some of my relatives who have married across ethnic lines because they went to the University of Zambia or they went to some colleges. Um, this is a revolution. It's a social cultural revolution, but it's a silent one. But happily, it is taking place in this country. And, and so I believe that uh, maybe in the next 50 years, 100 years from now, we will have what one can call you know, distinct Zambian culture. You know, because the offspring of these inter-ethnic marriages will probably more Zamb be more Zambian than you and me. And they will identify more with the nation rather than with the Bemba or Tonga or Lozi. And I think, I think that is inevitable. Uh, so, uh, we need to explore, you know, the cultural changes, the social changes which are, are critical in redefining this country. Um, uh, that's what I can say for the time being. Thank you. I'm Bob Liebenthal, Vice President of the Economics Association of Zambia. And perhaps first I can just congratulate the historians on a fantastic effort. And no one said it so far, but I think this uh, gathering 
and the lectures that were received are of a very, very high standard and you're to be commended. Um, I have, I think, one question and two comments. The question is uh, on economic history and I'd just be interested in what the historians feel, uh, how they would describe the state of the economic history of Zambia at the moment. My impression is that it's not very good, not much has, has been written, not much has been said, and it would be useful if you could just say a bit about that and whether, uh, what are the challenges in uh, developing that a little bit further. Uh, conceding that political history is obviously going to be more interesting and to, going to receive more attention. Um, my second comment, or my first comment, second remark, is uh, just coming back to the statement that Miles Lama made. I think P Professor Kalusa also may have referred to it. Namely, what is it that explains the decline in Zambia's economic performance uh, from the, really from the early 70s until around the year 2000? And uh, I think as economists, not as historians, we would, we are inclined to make international comparisons. It's not something that historians can do. And one very interesting comparison is to compare Zambia and Chile. Not a comparison that's often made by Africanists for obvious reasons. Zambia and Chile in around 1970 produced almost exactly the same amount of copper around 700 750,000 tons. After the redemption of the Zimco bonds and the uh, formulation of uh, Zimco and the full nationalization of the mining industry, Zambia's production fell to about 220,000 tons. In the year 2000, Chile's increased to 5 million. And that was facing exactly the same economic conditions. The, the, the reason why it's an interesting comparison is that the price of copper was the same, the price of fuel was the same. So I think I, my sense is that if you're having a debate about what uh, caused that decline between terms of trade and so forth and economic mismanagement, it is decisively answered in favor of the latter very hard, it seems to me, to argue with that. My third comment is to pick up on what uh, Professor Lama said about the relationship or possible relationship between uh, Zambia's very high degree of inequality and political stability. And I don't know, I, I think it's a very interesting question and it would be nice to hear what others have to say about it and invite someone to uh, really look at it in detail. But I just point out two issues that one should look at in that context. One is that Zambia, I think I'm right in saying, was at the time of independence one of the most urbanized countries on the continent and still is. Um, and that actually urban inequality at least in recent years, has been significantly less than overall inequality. And I guess the question I put to Professor Lama and others is, if you are positing that there's a relationship between political stability or the absence of conflict and high degrees of inequality, how would that take account of this phenomenon of uh, a high degree of urbanization and possibly at the expectation that urban areas would be more conflict prone than rural areas? I don't know. I mean, it's a, a question that uh, is a very appropriate one for economists, if I mean for historians and political scientists. Thank you. Let me start with the gentleman in Brochet and then Okay. Yes, please. Um, Humphrey Malamba, um, just all protocols observed. I think the first thing is I'll just take our hat off to Kapumpe, Mr. Kanya, 
and just like to mention something quite important that there are quite a few families um, which have been part of the, so to speak, the struggle and the like, and are part of the, the history of Zambia. And I think Dr. Bizek Piri as well can testify to this. I recall there was a time you came home. Um, but then I think in a lot of the instances with regards to the first statement which was made by the first gentleman, uh, mentioning that the, the side of the Secrecy Act. But I also think there's another side of it where I think there's been a lot of self-censorship by a lot of the families who have been part of it. And there's a fair amount of documentation which is in a lot of our possession, but we opt not to share it simply because of um, it's culturally incorrect, so to speak. <laughs> um, I, th I think that's the first side of thing. I think the second thing to mention is um, I think there's been a slight simplification of some of the discussions and arguments which have been put forward regarding some of the issues relating to Zambia's history. In particular, I'll talk, I mean, um, to some degree, aspects of the Zimco bonds. I think um, some things are looked at in isolation without considering the entire context of what was going on and the other underpin underpinning decisions which resulted into them happening in a particular way. So I think. Um, uh, you know, I'm um, um, self censorship again. There's certain things I can't say, but I am privy to simply because of the positions of certain people held within within the family. Um, I think the third thing, which is incredibly important, and and uh, I think has been highlighted to some degree, but would be helpful as well, is if we are to consider the, in essence, the state is the only authority which has the legitimate use of power and, so to speak, violence. And I think um, it would be helpful to have an understanding as well of those other parties which were considered to be oppressed or the other parties which were considered to be in defiance of UNIP's dominance and authority. It would be helpful to have their stories told as well as to why and what was going on. I think that's, I think that's an incredibly important aspect to actually consider to understand that some of the underpinning um, or some of the undercurrents occurring in, in, in the country right now. Um, and I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll essentially end there, but, but in short, it's, it's, it's a fantastic idea, it's a fantastic premise to start off, and there's a lot more to take up from there. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to go the lady here. And I would, li I'd like to make a very short comment about the, Mr. Uh, about the Professor Fili comment that Brazil and the Brazilian students have waited more than 150 years to start discussing any participation of ordinary people in any movement inside the country, despite all the revolution we have been having all these years. And we waited for more than 200 years of independence, almost 200 years of independence, to have a, an ordinary people in the presidency. So I think it's real, really what you said. It's an is we cannot avoid it. It will happen. But you have to make a lot of efforts to have the, the history said as people have really done it. Né? Normally, it's very difficult. Né? And I, I congratulate you to this effort here in Zambia with only 50 years of independence. Uh, the, I want to make a correction. He said the Motomoto Museum is on a witchcraft. <laughs> uh, we have updated now with cultural science, so it's no more witchcraft. <laughs> and then coming on the cultural about marriage and so forth, I think I wrote some articles about the Copper Belt tribe. I think the Copper Belt, that's where I've seen interpretation. And those people, they have got their own culture. And what they speak is not them, but just Copper Belt tribe. And then I think I read in the watchdog on the 12th of August about a young man who was saying sea cells is richer in Africa than Zambia and Namibia. So the young man wrote, he said, he cried the whole night because he didn't know where we had missed the gog. So that prompted me to write, to begin to write something, a serial, the shame of Zambia's poverty a mission without vision. In that I looked, because I'm touching on, is it politics that has brought about our dementia in the economy, or is it anything? Then I looked at Lesa Mumuru, 
kaunda punch meaning god in heaven kaunda when i looked at it very closely i found that nothing has changed the president power even an angel become a dictator by the constitution which we have so i said it would also be true to say god in heaven chiruba on earth because nothing has changed everything the president has got all the powers so to say president kaunda made zambianization and nationalization when he actually at independence we had only about 100 graduates and those who did the grade 12 were 1500 grade 9 6500 so there was a misa because we couldn't hold the the economy then Chiruva nationalized at a very quick space. At it. And then we have got, I mean, privatized, sorry. And then we have what present where we can make 21 districts without consulting the budget. So to make a district without <laughs> consulting the budget, those are things, are things which could be wrong. But then I looked at the other way around. I say, there is something wrong with our thinkers. Because it's only recent that they discovered that the president had so much power. Our intellectuals think with breaks on. Because of rare opportunities, they have failed to reason out. So me, as a free thinker, I get problems. Because I always think about why is water wet or how to live properly without money. So I think the great factor to our economy has been politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. <laughs> Let me uh, allow the presenter to respond to the comments or questions. <laughs> I politely invite my colleague uh, to speak first. He seems, re he seems reluctant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe because there are so many questions. Let me try and tackle a couple of these. Um, Bob, I mean, I think the, the state of economic history is like the state of the Zambian economy, profoundly uneven. Uh, we have small amounts of research on the mining industry and very little on very much else. I think there are huge areas of Zambia's economic history. Uh, Hubert Millen's excellent work on Sussman, for example, in retail is important. But I think, as I tried to indicate, uh, our knowledge of um, nationalized industries, part nationalized industries, and the extent of economic activity that affected the majority of Zambians outside the state-owned industries in the Second Republic really remains to be written in very much detail. And, and I, think, uh, I think I would agree with you there. Zambia and Chile, this is where politics, in it for me, trumps economics. Um, the explanation that this is simply about mismanagement the, the, the two things that make Zambia and Chile most different in this period are, are the, are the, is the nature of their states. The, the Chilean state is unresponsive to its people, to, to put it mildly. Uh, where it responds to its people, it responds uh, brutally. Um, and the Zambian state, even when it was a one-party state, um, it was once characterized by me, one of my favorites, uh, by a very senior Zambian politician as uh, being like a police state where the police could not afford petrol for their cars. And I think that's something telling about that. It was, it was both repressive but also somehow gentle and ineffective in some of its repression. And it, I, I think the point is it wasn't possible for the Zambian state to isolate the mining industry from the wider political pressures that it was under. And that remained the case even when Zambia was not formally democratic under the one-party system. It had to reward, it had to offer patronage, it had to provide mealy meal. It couldn't isolate from its ordinary people, and if it had tried to do so, it would have had to, frankly, use the levels of brutality, of repression that occurred in somewhere like Chile in the 1970s. So economic mismanagement, political factors, I think, are, are very important in that regard. Um, we, we had a couple of points, really, about the relationship, I think, between urbanization, which you raised, and rural areas. 
one of the sort of simplistic pictures of Zambia I try and give to some of my students who've never been here is, you know, Zambia is not the Copper Belt town, nor the village, uh, the quintessential African rural village. It's the people on buses going back and forth between those two places, coming to the town for school, sending remittances back to the village, exchanging experiences. Zambians, I don't think, in the majority, live in towns and cities on the one hand, or in villages on the other hand. One of the things which has perhaps contributed to this sense of inter uh, the knitted togetherness of different parts of Zambia is this dynamic of, of exchange of ideas, people, and so on, migration between and within rural and urban areas. And I think that's part of what is important when we consider an issue like inequality. Um, I think I, I think I will perhaps finish there. I certainly agree with, uh, fortunately for me, with everything that the uh, with that uh, Honourable Chitabakulu had to tell us. I think that uh, the idea of a Copper Belt tribe as being distinct, a distinct form of identity which speaks Bemba but is not the same at all as the Bemba that lives in Northern Province. This is a sense of how societies have developed over time for various reasons, and I completely agree that. Probably the biggest political problem that's been faced in Zambia is, as he very eloquently put it, that any saint, the most able politician, the most brilliant individual, faced with the powers of the Zambian presidency is likely to go astray. And it's very, very difficult to, once in that position, in plot one, for, the, for those powers and authorities to be challenged. And I think that's a salutary lesson. We need to focus not so much on individual personalities as on the the nature of those positions and the, the, the distorting effects of such power in one man's hands. Okay. Um, I will address my remarks to Mr. Mulemba uh, regarding whether there was opposition to UNIP hegemony. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, even though common knowledge, you know, you know, supposes that uh, opposition to UNIP came with the formation of the MMD in the 1990s. That is far from the truth. There have always been people in this country who opposed UNIP's hold on power. Uh, this reminds me of an article that I read by Jacob McCullough, uh, which as far back as the uh, the mid 1960s, as far back as 1966, people in Luapula, fishermen to be specific, were up in arms because of the failure by UNIP to fulfill what Makola calls the expectations of independence. Uh, UNIP made, made lots of promises during the struggle for independence. Uh, we were told that soon after independence, every family will have uh, two eggs for breakfast. Each member of the family will have two, two eggs for breakfast. Don't mention milk and butter. Um, the truth of the matter is that uh, UNIP failed to deliver on these promises. And, that's, and this is packed opposition. Unfortunately, this opposition was not well recorded. And I think it is our challenge to record this. Uh, the fishermen that I've alluded to uh, wrote letter after letter you know, denouncing UNIP rule as far back as 1966. Uh, the formation of uh, MMD many decades later um, was just coalesced to this kind of oppos opposition, you know, and uh, it became um, easy now because of the involvement of the elite who were disaffected by UNIP rule and who more or less ganged up in, under the MMD to throw out the uh, UNIP, UNIP leaders. And I'm glad to, say here, to see here one of the prominent actors in this process of challenging UNIP hegemony, Mr. Kashambatwa. And even the one who's sitting next to him, I remember as a student attending some of the rallies uh, where they sang songs to denounce UNIP misero. Um, anyway, but the point I want to make is simple. Uh, the truth of the matter is that UNIP has always been challenged from the time of independence up to the time it lost, it lost power to the MMD. It was, uh, you know, 
or it was facing opposition. But you know, it was a dictatorial party. Let's, ag let's agree. It was very difficult to remove it uh, because of the fact that it monopolized the instruments of violence, you know, and uh, it was going to be a battle. And it was indeed a battle to remove your NIP from power. But we did it. And, and, and this, this is what gives me a lot of hope for this country. The fact that we removed this major obstacle in the name of UNIP uh, shows that we are capable of resolving our problems and making something out of this country uh, through the efforts of every Zambian, uh, ordinary Zambians. Thank you.